the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people were evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos, and articles, and images. We spent a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live, it's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story, they were helping their neighbor. If a family was being evacuated, a group would just jump in and help out. It was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Aloha everyone, I'm geologist Philip Ong, here with Mr. Dane DuPont of HawaiiTracker.com. We're back with another Hawaiian Volcano Tracker. Uh, this is like what I've been titling up on our screen here, but this is our Kilauea Volcano Update. A little bit of Mauna Loa, today, Thursday, uh, June 9th, 2022. So the eruption of Kilauea is on the screen here between us. Uh, it's uh, still happening. Not a whole lot of big changes, but still great viewing. So we'll recap the viewing and the changes from USGS data and monitoring stream, images, videos, and all that. Uh, we will uh, be taking questions as we go, of course. Uh, Dana will be leading discussion in the chat, um, taking questions, and, and uh, we'll actually have two question breaks this week. So we'll kind of go through our regular update uh, uh, in our first part, we'll do questions on kind of what's happening right now. We'll do a middle part that's uh, a, a recap of a VOG presentation from the USGS from uh, several years ago. Um, have a little, little, little clip of that that we'll discuss as we go. And then we'll do questions on a VOG, a little bit more information on that. And then we'll kind of finish it off with a Volcano Watch and our research roundup uh, this week. So let us know if you have any issues with our audio or video. Let Dane um, know in the chat and he'll pass that info on. And Dane, anything to start us off this week before we jump into it? No, not really. A pretty, pretty uh, consistent week. Um, but, you know, that's been the story the past few months now. So, yeah, let's get into it. All right. Sounds good. Yeah, we have uh, a lot we're going to get through today. So I may as well um, jump right into it here. So 
let's put on our weekly summary graphic here. So starting off here is a, a view I've been promising you guys for probably well over a month now. It's a view from Kupinai Pali, Wadron's Ledge from the, the east side of the caldera, uh, what the, the volcano looks like. This is a, just a little time lapse I shot in my phone. I'll show you guys some more footage of that later, but this is our teaser this week of a different view of the consistent lava lake action. So you can see the lava lake is fully visible from that side. Um, I'll zoom it out, you get a little bit better view here, what that whole scene might have looked like, and it's actually kind of small down in there, but we'll talk about that here shortly in our, our viewing, but activity has been go going on as usual. Here is our last week of uh, uh, thermal data from our the F1 camera, courtesy of the USGS HVO, and we have our active lava lake right over here, oh, right over there, and it's been consistent. Um, it may have dropped in level a little bit earlier in the week. A week ago we had a deflation inflation event um, ongoing, so it did respond to that, but really otherwise it's been fairly steady. And perhaps as a result of that, we haven't had quite as many of these ooze up flows that occur around the perimeter. You can see there, there was one that occurs here, and there's a few that happen kind of off the screen there, and there's one over there, and a little bit of an overflow from the west vent cone over here. There's that one over here coming in on the left side of the screen. So a little bit, but not as much as we saw that previous week um, when it really seemed like it was coming up all around everywhere, um, multiple places at once. Um, if I zoom it in here to our west vent complex and area, right? The, here's all the, the vents with these glowing tops. You can see there's a little little top there. See this one actually is going to build up a little bit higher during this little episode in the last week. So a little flow and builds a new little peak glowing spot right there. Pretty cool. Small scale changes. Nothing, nothing really changing in a threat. Uh, over here is our what we've been calling the West Vent Pond. You can see the lava level rising and falling in there as well. And it seems like it comes up underground, under the crust uh, of this lava body, and it's venting out through this entire complex, which is in the edge of this larger ring that's uplifting. So we see it emerging here. It seems like it flows from this, from here down to there. Then it flows from there over that way. And then once it gets over here, then it's flowing kind of like this and going down and over here. And it also flows off in this way through that little gap into that southeast pit. And it's still flowing to this northeast branch arm. I'm not sure what we'll call that exactly, right? Almost like a little channel. It's kind of elongated there. So that's, that's a, uh, the usual, right? If I zoom it way in, maybe you can see these slight changes in lava level. Little pulses, it gets a little higher, or it starts a little lower, comes a little higher. It's pretty minor overall, and well within the range of what we've been seeing in the last few months. So, since this camera is um, functioning now, we'll load it, the most recent live view here. So this is an image from 10 minutes ago. Um, and cycling through from from yesterday. So within the last 24 hours, we've had a little bit of this ooze up over here, a little little bit of ooze up over there, and a little bit of ooze up over there. And not not much visible elsewhere on this frame. So the wider view is coming from this KW camera. All these webcams courtesy of the USGS HVO. And let's play the last week here. So there's our active lava lava lake area, and we can, we're looking at these perimeter areas that we couldn't see in the other camera. So when you look there, you see that there are some ooze up flows that occur um, both over here and over here, as well as some that are, I think, yep, yeah, here we go. And there's one over here on this side as well. So, but overall, relatively few and far between compared to what we saw the previous two or three weeks. And that's the last week KW camera. I see fairly consistent as Dane uh, summarized pretty well. And uh, Dane, in compiling these uh, images, pulled this one out for us. Uh, nice capture by the KW camera of this rainbow here. And uh, came in a week ago as we were doing our update almost exactly um, at this time last week. So pretty cool. Mahalo, Dane. Let's keep moving and see the most current views of the KW camera. Just in case anything's changing, sometimes these things will get a little more exciting for the nighttime viewership, um, even as we are broadcasting here. So interesting to see the last 24 hours there. 
seems like a little extra activity on that on that northern edge, northwest and northeast. Okay. Let's move on to our viewing, and to do that, let's change our title here and put up our viewing report. So this is a map from the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, showing the summit area here. And you come in the park over here, the entrance station, and there are all these different areas uh, where you can see glow all around the caldera where it's accessible from here all the way around. Right? But as far as seeing the lava lake itself directly, um, the first and most often cited place is Kanaka Koi Overlook over here, right down in here. Um, we've also mentioned Uwekahuna in the north, somewhat between the Kilauea Overlook area and the former Jagger Museum, closer to Uwekahuna, closer to the, the Jagger site. Um, we've also mentioned Kupina Ipali, which I started off the broadcast, Waldron's Ledge over here. So that's on the, over on the east. And we will go through go through those uh, today. We'll start off with Uekahuna, then we'll go to Kanakakoi, and then we'll come finish off with Waldron's Ledge. We'll work our way around um, in that order. So just to recap, here is that view from Uekahuna in the north. Um, that gap where you can see this whole, all this stuff over here within this drawn area is all that fresh lava crust. Uh, with the ooze up flows coming up, the shinier stuff over here in the daytime and at nighttime, you can see it glowing as well. So there is what it looks like um, within the last few weeks and also within the last few weeks. Oh, did I not get it up here? Also within the last few weeks, let me see if I can find this um, other image that um, I had hoped to... Okay, yeah, let's put it on here, this other image, okay. So there, um, also from the other week, or perhaps, perhaps a little over a month ago, you can see a nighttime view from the north as well. So areas you can see the lava directly, you can see the glow from that main vent in the lava lake showing up over here on the right, but you can't see it directly back in there. But still plenty of other lava to see. And this is a really close site to get to from the parking lot uh, without a whole lot of walking. It's paved the whole way. Um, of course, uh, Check the National Park website for all the things you should be um, bringing, flashlights and water and accessibility and all the, the closures and updates and all that. Right? So make sure you check in with those guys. All right, we've also used this uh, camera, B1 camera, which is looking to the east. So perhaps that view might get something like this, right? So look, it's looking from that direction from Uekuhuna, but you might see this part of the crater floor. So when we see big breakouts on this side of the crater floor on this camera, we can expect that there's a good viewing over there. So not a whole lot. There's a little bit of activity pops up here from this this uh, often used vent for these ooze ups over here on this eastern edge. Um, so some activity, but nothing really that exciting, to be honest there. We see that active lake in the background. We see other ooze up flows more so on this north northwest area right in here. And a couple over here in the far background of the camera, as we've been pointing out. So let's move on, and we'll look at the KW camera. This is way zoomed in here, so just looking in at looking in at this side over here, more or less. This is an area we're probably looking at that can see and be seen. So you can definitely see a couple of ooze up flows um, popping up, but you can certainly see that the activity is a little less than it's been in, pre in recent weeks. So not as consistent. Maybe not every single night. It does appear that it was a case last night, and it's looking good for tonight as well. So worth checking out, especially if you're uh, limited mobility there, that northernmost site. Okay, from the south, our view from our friend Two Pineapples. Uh, this is their panoramic view from a few weeks ago that I'm uh, using to show the view there, right? Lava Lake is down in this area right in here. If you really zoomed in, you can see all that area. You can nice broad view of Mauna Loa in both directions there. We've often used the S1 camera as our proxy. So here goes our S1 camera. Main active lava lake area, a little bit lower, a little bit higher, but always there all week. A little bit of interesting um, cascading into that southeast pit, as usual, right when the lava level drops a little bit. And we'll see an indication from one of the media um, released this week uh, about how sometimes there are pieces of rock that will block that channel, and then that also helps the lava level drop a little more. But otherwise, you see some maybe ooze up flows in the background back in here. Um, sometimes some Western activity. There's another ooze up over here. 
sometimes down over here. So obviously the, the breadth of view is much greater from any one place and these cameras are picking up. Um, we're piecing it together from all the different angles here. Viewing CSI. And the most current view here of that S1 camera. Looking a little voggy in the direction of the camera at this at that particular moment. So we can rewind it here for the last 24 hours. Yeah. Pretty normal. Not as exciting as, as this one, I think. Maybe I'll zoom it in just so we can get a closer look. You guys can get a little bit closer look at this little gap that's forming right in there and that variation of lava level. The camera does move a little bit at some point in the week. So you do see a little bit of a shift that's uh, not, the, not the lava itself. So pretty cool. Cool to see that feature persist. It's been a few months. And let's move on to, oh, this is that view we saw already. Um, let's move on to the view from Kupina Ipali, from that eastern side, Waldron's Ledge. So I was out there yesterday morning and uh, shot some video to share with you guys. So really zoomed in there, you can see uh, the, the spattering at the edge of the lake. The, the lava is flowing in that direction. That southeast pit is over there. And that channel in the northeast is going that way. So there's that wisp vent cone right up in there. And you can see all the gas coming out, not just there, but there's a, a, another um, uh, kind of spatter edge there in the foreground, uh, putting out quite a lot of fume and spots in the island as well. So the broader view, you can see the, the full view there, and I've really zoomed it in, and now I've sped it up um, in a little time lapse. So you can see a little better that, that animation, uh, the movement of the crust there. Um, once in a while, you see that west vent flare up. You can see the gas is pretty constant, and not just from that west vent complex, but you know, here this other area is pointing out. Here's the other sinking zone where the lava is spattering. You see gas coming up there, and also off the screen here to the sides, too. So, lots and lots of gas uh, all over the place. Um, pretty cool view, views. This is the edge of that down drop block in the foreground that you see in there. Here's that similar view at night. Um, if you happen to come not right at uh, dawn or dusk, where the viewing is a little different. So there's that edge of that down drop block right in there. Maybe you can see there's a GPS station right in here on that down drop block. And that's all within that broader collapse crater. So what I'm going to do is pan around a little bit so you can see. We'll pan over all those different views across the, the caldera floor and up to the rim. There is the old Jagger building, Uikahuna. Here's that viewing platform area right in there. That's the Uikahuna viewing area, as seen from Kupina Ipali over there in the east. And we'll pan back across. And there's a little lava lake at the bottom. Across all that gas. The re-exposed south silver bank. And then right in here, we're coming to that... Um, uh, what is that, the southern edge? And I'll pause it right there, right? So right there, there is an old Kanakakoi viewing overlook there, and the new one is actually right here, right in the foreground, right below it. There's, uh, you can see all the pylons, maybe if I zoom it in a lot. And there's that. There is that over old overlook, the new overlook. There's all the orange cones, visible from across the caldera here. You can see some people that may in fact be Janice with her Janice Way photographer for the park with her little wagon, perhaps. So coming back across, there is that full view at the bottom. You see lots of uh, uh, different kinds of lava, colors, textures. Uh, pretty fascinating. All the way across, and then there are that one little spot, the lava lake. And within that pit, there is that down drop block. And coming up to that main caldera floor, which there's still quite a lot of, you know, to give you an idea of how much the whole thing has to fill before it spill over to actually threaten anyone um, over top of the ground. And so tons and tons of room up there. Caldera is huge. The lava lake is really a small, small part of it. Here you can see a little bit, a little bit more of that broad view 
by the way, it's been a little extra on this for you guys since I've been promising it for, for so long here. So there it is, Mauna Loa's in the background. That's this upper slope right up in here. And you can see all this gas billowing up and blowing downwind um, down towards Kau, Pahala, uh, wrapping around to the Kona side, right? That's, that's been the source of the VOG for the last few weeks here. So that's a view from Kupi Naipali. I thought I'd pull out one other image. This is from uh, photographer Harry Durgan. This is posted on Hawaii uh, Tracker today. And this is a view, he uh, uh, an image he shot two days ago um, with uh, Janice Way over in a park. And he describes uh, uh, that perfect moment of three lighting sources of the setting sun, the moon, and the lava. And that perfect balance only lasts a moment. So there's Harry's shot, and you can see there's that lava lake in that very bottom left, slightly blocked by that crater rim because he's just slightly south of the of that viewing area in Kupinai Pali. So I bring us back to the map right in here, and there I try to click this to zoom in. Let's see if I can find. Here we go. There it is. Right, zoom into that area. So um, from Volcano House, you're really only seeing glow. But once you get to Waldron's Ledge, Kupinat Yipali area from here, you can kind of go all the way down along this whole ledge, uh, close to this Kiloiki Crater Edge. And that whole part of the trail in there, um, you can see the lava, uh, lava lake, uh, at least some piece of it. Um, over here, it's more through the trees. There's an occasional larger gap, um, whereas the this is an old um, overlook, yeah, um, Waldron's Ledge, that was part of the uh, Crater Rim Drive um, before the 1983 earthquake, right? So it used to be that the Crater Rim Drive um, came around like this, and like that, and we're off this way. And because a piece of it kind of in here fell into the crater they had to close off that road and turn that trail into a, uh, that, that road into a hiking trail so pretty cool cool things to check out over there as well besides the uh, views uh, of the lava which is awesome but of course all the native vegetation um, awesome stuff in a national park there more than just the lava to just to visit there of course right even though that's what we focus on all the time all right so that uh i believe uh uh, is our viewing report. So just for completeness here, we'll play our V1 camera showing the webcam of the lava lake just to kind of put it all together a little more zoomed in here. There's our reverse angle. So our flow is now once again back this way. There's our southeast pit. There's our northeast arm. And we also have that sinking spot right in here. And so lots of variation in there. I can zoom it in maybe for this pit area. To start, you can see some of those variations um, as the lava level uh, was down earlier in a week, especially right there at the beginning with that big gap. And then it rises up, and you can see a crest over, and uh, actually an archway will reform right here. Oh, there it goes. Oh, interesting stuff. We're spattering over here on that central eastern side of that of the active lava lake. And you can see this is one of the gas sources. Really, the lava is going down, and the gas doesn't want to go with it, so it comes comes out and it's flying away. And and, and in between, it's throwing the lava up, causing a spatter. And same thing over here in this northeastern arm of the lava pond, right in there. All right, so we will switch to looking at the media of the week. So this is one of several images. This one was actually released um, June 2nd, a week ago, um, after the videos we shared with you guys last week, and uh, perhaps during our broadcast. So uh, here is a, similar to the S1 camera view, right? Our source is now coming this way, and so our pit's over here. Now we keep changing the angles over and over, but it's part of why I keep drawing on the images for you guys to hopefully keep us all on the same page here. And yeah, there is that. That uh, northeast arm, central spot. Once again, there we go. Lava level was a little bit down, you can see, at this point in time on June 2nd last week. That was 
uh, that beginning of a deflation inflation cycle. Oh, moving through. Um, well, so actually, uh, before we do that, um, here's that, that little gap in that southeast pit. Right, photographed here, and this, uh, uh, this one actually has a, has, a, has a good description. So, image by J.M. Chang. Um, and this is a view looking north, spattering at the edges. And here is where I wanted to, uh, to highlight. In the southeast lobe, the lower right, lava moved rapidly southeastward from the pinched area through the lobe under the hardened crust of the southeast. There we go. Occasionally, solidified pieces of crust got stuck in a pinched zone, causing lava to slow. Once the solidified crust dislodged, the speed of the lava increased again. Oh, pretty cool to see that description on there. Mahalo for that. All right, so more images here. Uh, this is that uh, West Vent complex area. You can see lots of fume coming from the, from the edge there. And a nice view here at the edge of the road. You can see that, that double center line right here at the bottom right. Once, and then twice, and then three times way down there. On that down drop lock way down there. Maybe if I zoom it in for you guys to see. Way in there, yeah, that view. Down in the crater, and then the active lava lake area being over here. Behind all this gas. And there's a West Vent complex down in there. Okay, so we have some more photos and videos. There's a whole sequence released today. Um, including this panorama of that whole zone. So maybe I can zoom it in for you guys and see Mauna Loa there on the top left and pan it across and see that piece of road perhaps right down in there. Piece of road. And West Vent and Lava Lake there in the middle. Down drop blocks. Here you get a pretty good view of, of how far it still has to come up to reach that next block area as it's filling the, the ever widening crater. And over here at the far right, we see um, some of the webcams. Right, so pretty cool there. Nice, nice panorama, good series of images released this week. Uh, photo by uh, Katie Mulliken, Mahalo. So, photo by Jay Smith here. This one is taken from the south of that same pinch point again with that more crusted over spot like we just saw in that thermal, thermal um, or I'm sorry, the V1 camera image uh, just developing over the last week here. So you can compare that to the one we just saw previously from the week before. And pictures here of the cracking zone, right, as the center part of the crater floor continues to uplift, and there's lots of ooze-up flows that occur down on the edges, and lots of different ages and colors and textures of flow. You can see degassing zones that are actively degassing in other areas of discoloration, where there's clearly been other degassing occurring recently as well, too. So interesting changes here. Um, that sequence, uh, it's, like, it's cracking if you remember last week the video of the time lapse. This was uh, showing that whole rising in the crater floor, and this is just one, one static piece of evidence uh, associated with that. Here is our telephoto image of the West Vent area from an observation shift yesterday, it says. Uh, the steaming and degassing is where many other parts of the crater floor. They say here, a low roaring sound could be heard from the south rim of the crater, which seemed to come from the vent, vent area. Photo by J. Smith. Mahalo. And this one I enjoyed. This is zooming in to that main Tephra Island area, that original central island, that original big island in that floating lava lake that's been there since December 20th, 2020, the original return of lava to the summit following a 2018 eruption. So. There's not as much of it as there used to be. It's been getting buried, and one piece of evidence is pointed out here, and I'll try to zoom it in as much as possible. 
And it's right here, there's a little kipuka of this island right in here. It's separated by some of these lava flows that have come in and surrounded it. Um, but there's one piece that was sticking up higher. You can see that the lava is on lapping and starting to bury this thing a little bit on its lower edge here on the south. But uh, you still have uh, the high spot over here, um, kind of in the north. And it's visible, and you can see this spatter rim, and this, there's another high spot over here where there's another spatter zone at this very um, southeast edge of it right now. So all these things are, are cool to check out, uh, even in the daytime when you visit the National Park. So pretty cool to see that evolution of that. We can see it's been getting smaller, but it's hard to really um, gauge that from the, the, the lower resolution webcam images and from the thermal images and all that. So I really appreciate getting these extra views here. And finally, the last sequence of images here um, from a couple of days ago of the Southwest Rift Zone seismic, no uh, seismic nodes being deployed. So with collaboration, um, along with UH Manoa, they're starting to deploy these portable seismometers, temporary seismic nodes that are tightly grouped to den densely record earthquake signals across the region surrounding Pahala. So we've talked about this, there's a volcano watch. Um, so that's actually happening. So here they are actually deploying those images, deploying those, uh, that equipment, I mean, as yeah, seeing these images here. So that's the images of the week. Um, with that, we will pivot to our monitoring data, um, which is uh, pretty standard this week, but uh, this is one of the ways we keep uh, track of what's happening. So our total lava depth, 20, um, 21 until now, back in September until now, still rising steadily, not a whole lot of change. If I zoom it way in, Zoom it way in. There's a little bump that's occurring here now, but that's just because the laser is now pointing to an area within that circulating lake once again. So we're starting to see the changes in lava level starting to show again, like it happened back in here during this zone, right? But the thing is, um, because the lava lake is changing shape and moving and rising, and the laser is pointing at one spot, and eventually the lake kind of rose and moved out of the way, and then they've had to reposition it a few times. So it's all that same pattern, but sometimes you get a little extra detail like you did right in here and like we're beginning to get once again here. Um, as far as the overall GPS, uh, we're still showing extension from the north to the south part of the caldera, the summit of Kilauea, right? So there's a combination of both a south flank moving and of magma filling that whole area. Um, perhaps, perhaps, uh, um, building more magma underground than can actually get out there. So uh, we look, we're looking at some of these shorter term changes where it seemed like it might maybe had stalled or was, was uh, contracting a little bit, but now you can see within the last week here, this pattern is emerging more and more clearly that maybe slightly larger short, short term variations like we've seen here and like we saw here, but the overall trend is still one of coming upwards um, unquestionably here. And so still expanding, but you know, not at an alarming rate. An alarming rate would look like this. This was building up to the eruption, and then here it erupts and starts starts uh, sagging, contracting once again, before it uh, re-equilibrates here. And essentially starts recharging. So it's still recharging essentially here, even as it's putting out at the summit. Right? And this is a summit region. If we scroll down to the rift zone by pool, this middle rift zone, it's not recharging, it seems to be contracting. And that's been the case uh, with small variations as well, but that's been a case case pretty consistently since eruption began here back in September last year. Okay, as far as lava depth, we're gonna zoom it in here. Here is the last week, so one week ago, uh, lava depth had dropped, and since then it's gonna come back up. There's a little bump we'll discuss here in a second, but the deflation inflation resumes and lava level comes back up. And it's been pretty steady the rest of the week here. So the tilt plot that corresponds to that. This is a, our proxy for the, the pressure in a volcano, essentially the ground tilt nearby. So likewise, a tilt had dropped down. It comes up. Maybe a smaller mini little cycle there. But overall, pretty steady coming up. Right? 
since we have it here in detail, we can point out that when the inflation begins here, um, we actually are seeing at the same time this little pulse come through. Right? We see an immediate response in the lava lake, which is something we've discussed uh, in the past because uh, it, it, it informs us a little bit about the nature of the connection from deep that magma chamber to that lava lake at the surface, right? So when you see an immediate response like this, that leads you to believe that the connection is more open. But you see that after a brief little pulse, it actually comes back down and it kind of resumes that previous um, pattern. And it really, that real resurgence comes in right here on a delay, right? So there's something that's still partially obstructing it, right? So it wants to be open. It's, it's a little more open than before. We haven't seen these pulses that much. Um, but it's still close enough that we're still having that lag come in, right? And so maybe I'll put it to the month month plot so you, make, you can see a little more clearly here. But there is our one month lava depth. Um, here is when we had our adjustment in, the, in the, the laser. So here's when we start seeing the deflation inflations more clearly. So really we only have these two on the right, right? This was a small deflation inflation and a larger one that happened last week right there. And of course you see this one didn't do it. Right? There's no corresponding spike there, but earlier that small one did actually cause a little little spike right in here. If I zoom it way in, right, it kind of was coming down. It spiked up uh, when the inflation began, but it actually then lagged once again. Right? So I'm not sure how long we've had this pattern going. We can't see back beyond this, this uh, movement of a lava laser before we're probably pointing at the bank, and the bank's not showing that. It's only showing when lava is coming in and spilling over the edge kind of thing, that's when you might see it do something like this perhaps. Or if the whole edge is pushed up from below, from lava below it somehow, that could also be, be causing this kind of signal. We're not seeing that variation in the lava lake that's, that could show an immediate response unless the, the, the laser is pointing in there. So that's cool to see that that's happening now, there and there. And, and to recap, um, I'll pull out this, this is a volcano watch from back on March 3rd this year. Volcano Watch comparing today's lava lake with uh, observations. And they were noting exactly this, how in 2017 and 18 we were having immediate response from the green tilt to the blue lava lake level there, right? Immediate open conduit response. If I zoom in so you guys can maybe see it a little better. Pretty close correspondence, one-to-one. -one, right? But then in earlier in 2022, we were seeing clearly, uh, before we were seeing any kind of spikes, but we were seeing in green a tilt come up first. And then a delay, and then a blue come up, the lava level on a delay there, right? And sometimes it would do it more immediately, like there. And other times you can see the tilt went down, came back up, and down, back up. And the lava level didn't respond until way later over here. And so interesting to note of that, right? So sometimes larger gaps, sometimes shorter, shorter amplitude, and um, not seeing the same effect. And so this is essentially that new chapter in that story is seeing this feature come up, right? A little extra hybrid of that immediate effect with that delay. I probably got a little nerdy there, but we'll move on here with our update and show you guys the Summit SO2. Um, no um, real change in the range of measurements. Still bouncing from 4,000-ish um, high to 2,500-ish tons per day of SO2 low which is within that recently normal range, right? Um, still a lot of gas coming out, having a lot of impact. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail um, a little later than usual today, um, but we will get to it. Uh, today we'll actually move right into the earthquakes. Um, so looking first at Kilauea, here are the earthquakes over the last year, and really no change here at the right end of the graph, pretty steady within the long-term trend, within the context of uh, earthquake swarms and uh, intrusions and uh, eruptions coming and all that. So not a whole lot happening with the earthquakes, to be honest. Over the last month, maybe slightly more variation, but really not that, that significant when it comes down to it. Over the last week, here's a map. You can see there is one event offshore on the south flank, um, close to Kalapana, and otherwise our regular south flank action here. Kind of sparse in the summit region today, really, and a little bit more in Pahala than usual. Uh, usual in the last weeks or so, which was kind of slower. So maybe back to normal in Pahala a little bit. There is a cross-section. 
Yeah, and here is a frequency, so you can see a little bit more of these pickup and Pahala earthquakes in little bursts here and here and here. And this has been the trend. This is time now and depth going this way. Over the last month, a little bit more data. You can see a little bit more of that summit pattern. Um, still essentially the background is what we're seeing here. Background summit activity during the eruption. Uh, background Pahala activity during this, this uh, recent increase. That's just been the normal high levels almost all the time. Background levels in the south flank. And then we do, are having these extra uh, deep earthquakes still occurring as part of our background for the last few months as well too. So that's our normal right now. Um, in that context, we can look at the uh, latest earthquakes map, which is here. So all that looks familiar, Pahala earthquakes. There's one slightly offshore, deep also, um, similar to that, that Pahala depth. So maybe on that low heat track or on that edge in that direction over there. Louis he is right in here. Um, not a whole lot here in Kilauea, as we said. We can look at that, that one, larger south flank one, 3.1. You can see here at a depth of 6 kilometers, so right in that south flank um, zone. And it was felt by people around, So, um, but not, not anything abnormal, nothing to worry about there. Um, just business as usual, soft flank stretching out as it does all the time continuously. And that's why we keep checking the monitors, and the monitors are still showing contraction of the rift zone right in here. Right? So, um, it seems like magma is not, not really doing a whole lot in this lower area at the moment. Right? It's only a matter of time. We know, all know that, but uh, it doesn't seem to be happening yet. For now, everything is staying at the summit. No indications that it's going to stay there. There's no no sign of anything changing, and it's all good. Great time for viewing, and not and, t and good time for education and preparation, and um, those kind of considerations more so than than being worried about what water lava is going to go, as was the case four years ago, right? So Mauna Loa, uh, Mauna Loa, you can see has got some earthquakes near the summit. In that northwest zone, and also on the southeast flank, that's also essentially normal for Mauna Loa there. And so, switching essentially to Mauna Loa here, um, we can look at the earthquake rates on Mauna Loa for the past year. There it is. And they're actually going down slightly, but they're within this background range still. Nothing alarming, nothing really worth discussing further here. Kind of low, in fact, right? So, um, Maybe the only thing to, to mention is that these mon this this earthquake rates is essentially in that uppermost zone. This is that's only including these ones right in here. Essentially, right. some of these ones on the flank can be more active and won't, won't show up in this graph. So it's normal to have have lower uh, amounts at the summit, and maybe you're having some more flank action that's not quite caught on here. Um, that's maybe leveling things out a little bit. For the GPS across that small area of Mauna Loa summit. Maybe a slight extension south and north, but nothing alarming there either. All right, so um, we will cover um, right now the hazards, um, which mostly is VOG, right? Because the lava is not going anywhere. But the VOG is going, going um, across much of this south and west part of the island, and it's been kind of gathering here on this west side. So. Even though we're having summer trade winds, um, we're having much of this stuff get caught in the corner side and still seeing reports and seeing the, the measurements um, of VOG in that area. So this is put in with a slightly lower uh, emission rate, a little under 2,000 tons per day here. Um, but the distribution pattern is what really matters here. So Similar, not a whole lot blowing to the helo side this week, but um, let's check our purple air. And let's see what's going on here. Purple air for the island. And make sure it's refreshed. This page sometimes doesn't like to be in the tab setup I have here for our broadcast. Okay, so we're just showing zeros in this area that that maybe it's clear right now. Yeah. 
here right now, but you can see that there are other times where it's bumped into the yellow here. Um, Bahala over the last week. So moving further south in Nalehu. Similar, you see, not consistent, but bumping into the yellow over and over and over again um, many times here over the past week. Coming back around the south Kona. You see similar, actually spending more time in the yellow there. Let's add in. Let's add in here. Let's, let's see, I think I'm getting too many lines in there. Let's start it fresh. Let's start in over here. All right, uh, Lion's Gate Farms. You can see how much it's been in yellow over the last week as well. So the point is, impacts are still going. I can pull it all the way up here to near that saddle intersection. Or right now, the air quality is fine, but you can see there are a couple of spikes still. The Vlog is still making it all the way up into the saddle as well. So the Vlog effect is still real. Um, We'll spend a little more time on that today. I know there have been a lot of questions about VOG. Um, we'll we'll uh, get to those uh, when we do the VOG section a little later on. Um, but to kind of finish off as far as hazards here, we'll look into the National Park. In the National Park, everything's in the green. This page also needs to be reloaded. There we go. Um, the wind is blowing off to the southwest, so most of these sites are upwind in the green. And a park-wide advisory in the green, we can grab this and pull it back. And we can see, oh, there actually was a site that was um, in the orange um, yesterday evening. So we can explore that further. We'll click here on advisory by site. And here we are, SO2 on the left, particulates on the right. Um, for the most part, right? Sometimes it changes. We'll scroll down here and let's see. Looks like mostly we're in the greens, even at Kahuku over there, um, and that's southwest of the summit area. But we do have one orange popping up here at Kela Como Overlook. This is interesting. This is an SO2 station, sulfur dioxide. Only one interval, one 50 minute interval likely, of that orange. Um, but um, this is noteworthy. Um, it could just maybe been some, you know, extra uh, local source or maybe the, the the wind just brought like a little batch of gas from the summit down there just for that for that moment in time but if i pull it back to this map up here all right the reason i kill como overlook which is right down in here on the china craters road was often significant is just because it is downwind of pool all right so we're not there's nothing to be alarmed about here i don't believe right but it's just something to kind of look into a little further because we're being extra careful right we saw from the from the gps that everything is contracting we're not expecting there's anything necessarily coming out of there but interesting to just check on there as well right so we can go to the most recent usgs update right and which is a source of all of our information here and the hazards and all of that and uh they say no significant changes um lava lake observations are pretty similar to um, what we saw been reported reported by the maps last month, SO2 rate of 1,900 tons per day yesterday, June 8th. And as far as east rift zone observations here, uh, we can see no unusual activity on the east rift zone or southwest rift, rift zone. Steady rates of ground information and seismicity continue along both. No tremor episodes were observed, and this has been the standard now to not see tremor anymore. Uh, measurements from continuous gas stations downwind of pool oil in the Middle East rift zone remain below detection limits for SO2, indicating that emissions are negligible. So just a little, just a little footnote there. Of course, here's the main hazard analysis comes from the USGS. Um, so check that out, uh, if you, especially if you want to come through these other links about um, all the fact sheets and all that for, for gas. All right, so with that, Dane, I think we are ready to um, um, say some thank yous and um, yeah, your call where we go from there. Oh, I can't hear you. The, only, the mic is not great with the mute button. Um, all right, so start off by thanking everybody that tuned in today. 
Um, we rely on viewers like you to help get this message out. We don't have an advertising budget or anything like that. So it's basically the algorithm and the shares that you're able to provide us on other uh, platforms of social media. That really goes a long ways to help us. Also, like, share, subscribe. That all helps as well. Um, we have a couple people that are particularly Kaleo's Barn Grill that we want to thank for their longtime support and continued support. Uh, Kaleo's Barn Grill is in Pune. They have two locations, one in Orchid Land and one in Pahoa. They have different hours, different menus, and entirely different vibes, really. It's a you know a great little contrast they have going on. Um, indoor, outdoor dining options, all that. Um, takeout options. But really, they do some uh, great twists on some traditional dishes with a little bit of local flair on them. And great environment, so we really appreciate Cleo's Barn Grill for their continued support. They, um, are they doing, doing live music do, there, Dan? Thursday nights? Yeah, still? they're doing. Uh, yeah, Thursday nights. The Kaikamarzo is playing. I think pretty regularly now. Um, so make reservations early for that one because last time I went, that thing was sold out, and it looked like it was uh, sold out for a day or two. Uh, Kaikamarzo, of thing. course, was so, important in an eruption, but he's also the intro intro. Uh, soundtrack that we play in case you're right. wondering yeah and we also got the all the the other regulars from the calipana band um so yeah definitely worth checking them out and yeah thank you Cleo's barn grill we also have a 20 dollars donation from chris who says thank you for keeping us updated appreciate that as well um we do uh make all these uh videos and everything also available on hawaiitracker.com which is where we Put all these uh, updates in so you can go to one spot to kind of find them all. And uh, I think with that, we can get into some questions. We don't got many yet. If you do have questions, go ahead and get them in the chat, and we'll try and get them at, uh, to fill up. But right now, we do have a couple to start with. Um, first one is from Victoria. who says, no sign. Okay, no signs uh, this eruption is stopping at all, or is it better this way so magma does travel somewhere that endangers humans again? Yeah, we like where the, we like what we're seeing, right? The magma, you know, it usually comes out at the summit. That's why it's the highest point of the volcano. It's piled up the highest there over the volcano's whole lifetime. So it's the most likely most likely place for it to come out, and that area is where the national park is um, to prevent development in part, right, as well as to provide access. Um, so yeah, that's a place where it's where it's great for it to be um, within that giant crater. You know, I've referred to it as a lava, lava viewing stadium. So it's really a time for viewing, and when it's coming out and it's you know filling the that summit area, then that's great. Um, the problem is, of course, it's never going right. to stop filling from below, and so at some point it's going to fill it up, even if it takes decades. And you know, within that time scale of decades, we can expect other eruptions on the rift zones as well. And so at that point, we'll, we'll shift our concern, you know, it'll be a different kind of update. Um, and that's why now I keep saying over and over again, like, this is the time for viewing. The viewing is great. It's time to visit and nothing to worry about. It won't be that way forever. We're, you know, we're, we're straight up and honest about that. Um, but for now, um, there is no sign, right? If the magma kept coming in from below and was not coming out of the summit and was filling the rift zone, it would be a whole different feel right now. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. All good for now. Um. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. It's it's such great viewing right now. You can ask for anything better in that regard. Um. Such easy access. Uh, right there. Um. You have all the national park supervision and everything, so it's really good. Um. Right now, we do have a couple more super chats that came through. Want to acknowledge them? Uh. Susan L with a fifty dollar donation. Uh. Emoji of a I don't know on a rocket. <laughs> Appreciate the support, Susan. Uh, Gary Bryan, longtime supporter, comes in. Thanks, guys, with his $35 super chat. And Robert Walt uh, says, thanks for being you. And with an emoji, a $20 super chat. Appreciate everybody. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, Thank you, next everyone. question uh, is from Richard. So he's talking about uh, the temporary seismometers that has been deployed. And uh, how deep uh, do you think that those can detect? Okay, so I'm going to pull back up the Volcano Watch article from uh, May 12th, which actually addresses that directly. And um, I think, I think uh, uh, really the difference isn't so much the instruments, but how they deploy them as far as the density of them. Um, and obviously they're not installing them permanently. They're, they're setting them up uh, temporarily like more at the surface rather than digging a giant hole and burying them underground. So in any case... Um, 
where does it say here? Um, the densely spaced nodal instruments recording earthquakes over a wide range of depth and locations will collect data from the region at, the region at an unprecedented resolution. Uh, they'll be able to, to create images of the structure of the Earth beneath Pahala from as great as 40 to 50 kilometers, 25 to 31 miles below sea level, all the way to the surface. So there is your answer, Richard. 25 to 31 miles down, um, 40 to 50 kilometers down, all the, way, all the way to the surface. So that's that whole zone where the earthquakes are happening deep, deep down. Um, below that, right, to see, try to image what the source is below that as well. So to try to catch all of that. So pretty cool. Yeah. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, definitely. All right, we have a five dollars super chat from SJ, and with that, we'll go. I oh, appreciate that. Um, we will go into the next question. Uh, if anybody has any questions, throw them in the chat. But next one is from Richard, uh, or no, from um, what was it? Dennis, who uh, asks about the late rate of the lava rising, and when do you think it might uh, crest over that? Um, next ridge that it's uh slowly approaching towards um i don't remember if i have the graphic handy but um it's the estimates that we that we've made it all depends on the rate of course and the rate's something that's not the easiest to measure right but at the rate we've measured and the answer essentially is, is somewhere in november or december maybe thanksgiving time ish might be when you would expect that that uh, next ledge to get overtopped. Um, I'm looking for the graphic here. I haven't found it yet. Um, so um, since you since you created that graphic, has it been mostly consistent with the uh, volume, the flex or flux? Yeah. So it, we've only had essentially two me two recent measurements. There was one that was at the higher rate that lasted a short time. And then I had made a projection with that one, but then we all, I also used the, the measurement that was the one before that, which is what we went back to afterwards, at around three, three and a half uh, cubic meters per second. So at that slower rate is, is what I'm using. Um, and you know, obviously the rate could change, right? That's really the, the caveat there. The rate could change. Um, here it is, I uh, found it. Let me throw right. it on the screen. Let me see what's on our screen here. All right, so this is 3.2 cubic meters per second rate. And down here in the bottom is a date. So um, here we are currently, it's pretty close to there, right? But by, by the end of 2022, before 2023, at this rate, it should hit the down drop block. And it would take another couple years for it to reach that point where the lava had been in 2018, right? Um, that high point of the 2018 lava lake. If you're thinking about how much lava could be in that crater to to reach similar um, situations as before, before we had lava lake at this high point, and we had the entire east rift zone filled all the way to Pu'o'o and Pu'o'o to, to its high point, also that was a difference in 2018. So this is only one part of the equation, um, but for that measure, it would still take a couple of years extra beyond that. And even still, it could, if it's not going through the rift zone and spinning out at the summit, instead it could keep pouring out of the area, fill the whole caldera floor by, you'd think, the beginning of 2027. And for it to actually spill all the way out to flow out of the caldera, it would be to the southwest into the national park away from people. That would be in 2028. With a highly dependent average on that emission rate there, right? Um, which can go up, it can go down, it can, you know, change, or it can stop, it can start. When eruptions start again, they have very high high rates, right? So it could actually, you know, do something like this, like where it's where we had this phase in December 2020, where it put out a huge volume quickly, and then it stopped. And it put out quickly again and jumped up high. And then now here we are, right? So if it if it does more of this, it can do this do these jumps as well. Or it could keep a steady rate rate. In either case, it's gonna take a while. So that's an over answered question, probably. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, actually, we do have one more question. We'll try and sneak in here. Um, Duchess asks I heard rumors that Fisher 8 has uh, been active a lot. My question is is uh, will we see another 2018 eruption? So basically, um, that, that scale of eruption in the Lower East Rift Zone uh, is that expected again? I believe that's the question. 
question. Not anytime soon. Um, right. Right. I mean, it's happened several times in the past. It'll happen in the future, but it's, you know, that's probably decades and decades and decades away for another, another one of those kind of eruptions, right? Not to say that smaller eruptions like Kapoho in 1960 and 1955 Leilania weren't equally destructive or close to as destructive. Even, right? even that little Jonica flow that yeah. happened just uprift. So, um, yeah. the eruptions yeah. don't have to be huge to, you know, I mean, and we, and we desc described last update how, uh, about two thirds of the lava ended up going in the ocean. I mean, that was great for like it not covering land. If all that lava had been put up on land and spread itself everywhere it could have, then it could right. have been much worse. Right. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah. it's a whole different conversation, There's right? You know, um, eruptions in a rift zone are expected, right? You're likely to have, have, uh, smaller ones more frequently than larger ones, but even along the rift zone, depending on how far you are from the summit, you have different, different frequencies of eruptions, right? So, uh, within the upper east rift to Puuo'o, it's much, 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 much more likely. So I would bet money on that possibly even in the next few years, right? Before these decades timeline. Um, but as far as a lower east rift zone, right? Kind of below right. Jonica, Highway 130 and down, like that area like gets it so infrequently um, that that area is really, I'd be much more surprised if we see something there um, anytime soon. Um, that said, it can happen, right? It was only five years between 55 and 1960 that magma traveled through those areas. Um, so you kind of just never know. Um, but it does yeah, not look that way at the moment. Weird. Yeah. You get something, something weird like 24 where... Get something weird. Um, Right, where it maybe erupts in the ocean or it just intrudes down into the rift zone and does potentially. But yeah, yeah it's unpredictable. Yeah. Okay. So there's well, no for sure answer. For... But yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that does it for the first round of QA. We will be doing at least one more. So um, if you got any questions, go ahead and put them in chat and we'll try and get to them in the next one. All right. So we got okay. some uh, some presentations to go through, huh? Yeah, so let me see where I was right here. Okay, so I'm going to start off by just by just answering a question straight up that we are, have been asked a few times um, here, which is uh, what exactly uh, is in the VOG, right? So um, hold on a second here, let me get the right. Um, let's get our VOG overview label up on here. Okay, here we go. VOG is the is the term for volcanic fog in case you haven't heard that before right? and if you probably have heard about it way too much and you're asking then maybe that's why you're still here right so uh 99 of the gas molecules emitted during a volcanic eruption are water vapor carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide 99 percent the remaining one percent is comprised of small amounts of hydrogen sulfide carbon monoxide hydrogen chloride hydrogen fluoride, and other minor gas species. Yeah, and I remember reading at one point, there's over one ton of metals that come out uh, of all the different, different uh, kinds of metals um, come out every day from, from, or came out in the past from that lava lake at the summit of the volcano. So there's more to it than, than, than just this. And a lot, lots of times those minor gas species, even in small, small um, concentrations, can be um, can add up right over time if you have the thing just pumping out gas over and over and over again. So here's one answer from the USGS. Uh, there's another version of this answer here. And what is VOG? How's it related to SO2? So VOG, volcanic smog, is a visible haze comprised of gas and an aerosol of tiny particles and acidic droplets created when sulfur dioxide and other gases emitted from a volcano chemically interact with sunlight and atmospheric oxygen, moisture, and dust. <laughs> And they can pose risk to nearby communities. So there's a couple of different answers of what actually is in the VOG. But as I was trying to find you know, a good answer to this, what I really came down to was a presentation um, um, from January 2014 as part of Volcano Awareness Month that was presented by uh, Tamara Elias, a gas geochemist at Hawaiian Volcano Observatory at that time. And um, 
I thought I would clip clip a, a, this part of what Vogue actually is because uh, she does a, does a great job um, of sharing of sharing that. So well, we'll stop this at a few points um, as we go along, Dane, and um, we'll discuss it as we go. So it's a, um, a little more interactive here. So, but to start it off, uh, here is Tamar um, talking about what what the Vogue is. I am going to talk about the not so scenic and charming part of volcanic emissions. And that's uh, volcanic pollution, also known as VOG. Um, Can you hear that? Um, what it is, where it goes, how it's affecting the human and natural environment, and um, how we're adapting to living with the um, constantly degassing um, from these volcanic eruptions. So um, in a by now familiar story, um, SO2 gas is the main culprit in the formation of VOG. And uh, as this gas and particle rich plume moves away from the crater, the invisible SO2 gas reacts in the atmosphere with water and oxygen and dust, um, sunlight and other gases and particles, and it converts to sulfate particles, little tiny particles. And the particles are very efficient at scattering light. Um, and so you get this visible haze. And here's the view of Mauna Loa from the Jagger Overlook. Um, and you can see the flank of Mauna Loa disappearing into this haze of volcanic pollution. The main um, components of VOG are acidic sulfate particles like sulfuric acid, uh, neutral sulfate particles like ammonium sulfate, and also unreacted sulfur dioxide gas. And the exact composition of VOG depends on... Is that too quiet, Dan? Can you hear that? Let me, let me see if I can find another way to, to do it. It's pretty quiet. It's manageable with headphones, but without, maybe not. Okay, so let's see if I can... Let's see if I can find another way to do this. So just a second, let me um, improvise a little bit here and find another program to open this with and put it in the right piece of my screen and all of that. So... I am going to talk about the not so scenic and charming part. We'll see, maybe. And that's uh, volcanic yeah. pollution, also known as VOG. I'm going to talk about um, what it is, where it goes, how it's affecting the human and natural environment, and um, how we're adapting to living with the um, constantly degassing um, from these volcanic. Okay, I'm gonna start it over. I am going to talk about the not so scenic and charming part of volcanic right. emissions, and that's uh, volcanic pollution, also known as VOG. I'm gonna talk about um, what it is, where it goes, how it's affecting the human and natural environment and um, how we're adapting to living with the um, constantly degassing. So is this after dark in the park, this presentation? Eruptions. Yes. So, um, familiar story, um, SO2 gas is the main culprit in the formation of VOG. And uh, as this gas and particle rich plume moves away from the crater, the invisible SO2 gas reacts in the atmosphere with water and oxygen and dust, um, sunlight and other gases and particles, and it converts to sulfate particles, little tiny particles. And the particles are very efficient at scattering light. Um, and so you get this visible haze. And here's the view of Mauna Loa from the Jagger Overlook, um, and you can see the flank of Mauna Loa disappearing into this haze of volcanic pollution. The main um, components of VOG are acidic sulfate particles like sulfuric acid, uh, neutral sulfate particles like ammonium sulfate and also unreacted sulfur dioxide gas. And the exact composition of VOG depends on how long that sulfur dioxide gas has had to react and convert in the atmosphere. So if you're far away from the source, then uh, your VOG is going to be predominantly particles. So here's a picture of Maui, Haleakala, from Saddle Road on a clear day. And then here it is on a loggy day where it's disappeared behind this predominantly particle haze. Um, but this nice dog has appeared. Uh, closer to the source, the bog uh, has unreacted sulfur dioxide gas in it. So here's a group walking in the national park through a gas and particle haze. And you can see they're trying to protect themselves because the SO2 is very irritating to breathe. Um, here's Hilo Town across the bay uh, in a gas and particle brew. And uh, not only are these particles very effective at uh, creating a visible haze from the ground, uh, but you can also see that haze from space. And so here's a satellite image 
of the emissions from Kilauea being blown by the northeasterly trade winds to the southwest, where they wrap around the island, and then they move onshore and offshore along the Kona coast with the daytime, nighttime sea breeze. And um, you can see that during trade winds, this part of the island is upwind of these emission sources. Well, when the trades are interrupted, then East Hawaii can be impacted by the plume. Uh, the whole island can be impacted, or the island chain. And so here you can see Maui and Molokai during uh, light and variable wind conditions. And by the time the plume makes it to Oahu, then our phones really start ringing. <laughs> People on Oahu want to know what's up with the volcano. And um, the fog has been measured um, uh, thousand, um, hundreds of miles from the island. Um, so as far as uh, even to Johnson Atoll, which is nearly a thousand miles west of the island. All right, Jane, I think we actually saw in 2018 with those higher amounts of emissions that it that was going much farther, almost to the Philippines, something like that, right? Um, but this talk was from before that whole 2018 eruption. Um, so uh, just keep that in mind. This is more about what VOG is and not about like how bad it's been necessarily because they, have, they haven't seen us at the time they're giving this talk. I can't hear you. When she was um, mentioning that, you know, the, island, the entire island can see the VOG, yeah, definitely you'll uh, get people in Hilo uh, talking about it whenever the southern winds come out. But I, I really, you know, out in, on the eastern tip of the island, I really can't say, like, other than the emissions from the 2018 vents, that there's, you know, that I've seen boggy conditions down here. Um, just the winds are so dominant. Right, um, right. To me. That it just, and it's so far away um, at that point. It's getting farther and farther, harder and harder in that direction. But yeah, downwind, it can pretty much get everybody. Yeah, and the other thing to keep in mind is the, the sources, right? The sources now are different. So in 2014, Pu'o'o was a source, and there was also an ocean entry as a source, right? And so the ocean mm -hmm. entry plume might have been blowing different directions depending on the winds or the Pu'o'o plume. In it. So there was, there was a, a different impact because of that as well, right? And so, and certainly during 2018, the ocean entry plume was just ridiculous. Right. Not only was a fisher eight plume ridiculous, right. but the ocean entry plume was also ridiculous as far as its volume and and presence and everything about it. Everything it affecting absurd. the weather. Yeah, it's just uh, yeah. The heavy so, metal fallout in Leilani, like all of that, was just wild to find out about more and more, and yeah. see just the scale of it comparing to what we'd seen before. Right. Right. So in a lot of ways, like 2018 was really like the, the record breaker of everything. So and this talk kind of precedes that. And so this is more about kind of conditions as it might be now rather than they were in 2018. Right. It's a little bit we're, we're a little bit more analog to what we saw in 2008 to, to 18, which is a phase that this talk comes mm -hmm. from um, today as far as Summit Lava Lake and emissions being in that range of a few thousand tons per day. Right. Anything else in this first little clip? Okay. We'll play a few more minutes. Yeah, I think we're good for the first little clip. All right, play a few more minutes here. Um, so here's a view from the space shuttle showing the emission sources under prevailing northeast trade winds. And what you can see is that the summit plume is traveling along the flank of Mount Loa. And um, the east rift plume from Pu'o'o and the ocean entry plume, when we have one, uh, they travel, they're at a lower elevation, and they travel uh, along the shore and sometimes even a little out to sea as they move on to the west side of the island. And um, now that that major source of gas is coming from the summit, uh, the communities that are directly downwind in this area um, have much higher concentrations of SO2 gas. And so I'm going to show you some of that now. Um, so here's Bahala. Uh, here's the summit and rift emission sources. And this is the closest um, large downwind community. Um, and uh, What's shown here are the number of hours in each of these years that the, uh, the SO2 exceeded the EPA health standard. So you can see the big jump in 2008 when the eruption started at the summit, and things were pretty bad. And then um, in the last couple of years, things have gotten a bit better. Uh, this is still very high um, because according to the EPA criteria, uh, in order to protect public health, you really don't want more than 1% of your time above this standard. For comparison, here's the same treatment of the data of the National Park Service data. Um, so right where we're sitting. And even though we're very, very close to the vent, we're generally upwind. 
And so um, these represent uh, periods of time when the trade winds slacken, and we have wind reversals. Um, so even though we're so close, um, we're generally upwind here. As you move away at increasing distances in both the upwind and the downwind direction, the communities are still impacted, but at a much uh, lower rate. So uh, here's ocean view um, down here. And now you can see the, the number of these exceedances is on the same order as what's experienced in the national park, uh, but where it's at a much greater distance, and it's uh, in the prevailing dominant wind direction. And then even all the way over in Kona, um, even though this just looks like there's no bars there, uh, this shows the number of hours that this standard was exceeded in each of these years. So there's still a little bit of gas uh, by the time we get over there. Uh, in East Hawaii, um, even though you're upwind most of the time, because of the proximity to the events, when the wind does reverse, uh, we see exceedances of that standard. So much less than the downwind communities, but somewhat more than the distant community. Um, so now... All right, I'll stop it right there. Because I thought that graph was pretty interesting, yeah? Have you seen that before, Dane? These uh, percent of time of exceedance? Unmute yourself. Yeah, I haven't seen that one before. Yeah. Just looking at it now, really. Yeah, so it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, this is um, obviously back back in 2014, right? Um, or 2007 through 2012, as it's on the graph here. But um, yeah, interesting to, to, to note that, right? And of course... 2018 blew all of this all the way out of the water, but this is kind of more or less where we are now. So, um, yeah, you'd have to rescale that entire graph probably. Yeah, 2018 was there. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah. So, I mean, well, as far as yeah, I know, yeah, yeah, hours. There's only so many hours in a year, right? You can only go to 100 percent as far as far as hours oh, right, in a year. Right. Um, but yeah, the intensity might have been like a, a lot more, and it, and it did last like what full four you know four months really of a lot of gas coming out. So interesting stuff there. Uh, interesting to see that difference in ocean view. I wonder if that's the same still today, Earth since 2018, right? We hear a lot from our, our uh, ocean view viewers um, about gas in that area, right? And so um, interesting to note those those percentages, at least back in the day. I'm curious. Uh, what Back then, did they not able to, or did they not separate uh, particulate matter from SO2? Because it's saying, you know, hours of PPM. Um, uh, if I can see that right, I, it's pretty small on my screen. So maybe you can correct me on that. Yeah, this, it's just saying hours above the EPA standard. And the EPA standard is, oh, okay. is, is what could change there. Um, oh, I lost okay, my I spot. just can't even see it. Like, right, right. <laughs> hardly, sorry. Some of the problems using the old uh, presentations is it does, it's not as crisp. Right, right. All right, let's see if I can find a spot. I think it. Oh, this uh, alternate software is. If we're production loss. Oh, not, okay, here we go. That's possible, but somewhat more than the distant community. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the impacts of all this gas. And I just want to remind people that um, we're not health researchers, so this is information that's published, uh, and some of it by collaborators that we've worked with. Um, so there have been a variety of health studies on Hawaii that have shown um, effects from the high concentrations of gas and particles. Um, for example, uh, many people on the island catch their drinking water um, from rainwater catchment um, you know, into a cistern. And early on in the East Rift eruption, so decades ago, it was found that some of these water catchment tanks that were uh, downwind, actually 23%, had elevated levels of lead. And so uh, lead from the building and plumbing materials was being leached uh, by the acid rain that was being um, contributed to by the eruption. And so, so that was just like 2018. I just stop it and jump in and throw that in. That's what we're just talking about, Hunane. Yeah, definitely. Some of the people in these homes also had elevated levels of very blood. interesting, um, and that was um, that was addressed sorry. by removing or isolating. Got other things I'm looking at too. Materials. All right, I keep playing um, it. There have also uh, been studies that have shown that there is an increase in respiratory symptoms um, with the exposure to fog, and that includes things like cough and wheeze and sore throat. Uh, as well as an uh, uh, increase in relative risk for certain kinds of sickness, like um, aggravation of asthma and uh, acute bronchitis and pharyngitis, which is inflammation of your throat, 
and upper respiratory infections. And I feel a little bit like the poster child for this <laughs> tonight. Um, there were increases in emergency room visits, particularly after the 2008 eruption um, in the downwind hospitals. And then uh, one researcher on Oahu found that there was an association between eye irritation and fog exposure. The study was conducted in a month that also has very high pollen counts. Um, there's also been effects to agriculture. Between 2008 and 2011, the entire island had a federal disaster designation. And this allowed the farmers and the ranchers to take advantage of assistance programs. And um, so these programs were for production loss in the area of crops and trees, aqu aquaculture and um, livestock, and also infrastructure. And the greatest losses were found in the area of infrastructure. So ranchers found that their metal fences and gates, uh, even if they don't last a lifetime, usually would last 15 years or so. And now they're lasting between three and five years. Uh, this shows a metal rail that on the windward side, the um, blowing acid mist is rusting the rail, whereas on the leeward side, um, it is not affected. And here's, uh, for people in Volcano, this is probably familiar, bird tail plants in the bog episode, and a notice from a farm stand um, declaring that due to bog damage, uh, they don't have any vegetables. Um, there have been some clinical symptoms of fluorosis in livestock, um, as suggested by um, the decay in this calf's teeth. Uh, early on in the eruption, it was found that um, pasture grasses directly downwind, as well as rainfall, um, was enriched in fluoride. And um, too much fluoride is, is not a good thing. Um, and um, also there were some mineral imbalances in the livestock. Um, and the livestock were also suffering from uh, prolonged drought and um, exposure to high concentrations of gases and particles. I was just going to mention that there are uh, adaptations by native plants so that they can survive in this environment. Um, the ohia has the ability to close uh, the stomata in its leaves, so the breathing pores in its leaves. So when the concentration of gas goes up, it can actually stop breathing. Um, eventually, of course, a plant needs to take a breath. And so uh, if you're in an area where there's high concentrations of SO2, even the native plants like this koa tree show damage. Um, now, Okay, another brief pause here. So, as far as yeah. uh, the health effects, yeah, we've seen yeah big variations. She mentions a lot of them. Um, there's a little bit more in a Q and A. She comes into it a little bit afterwards, right? But it really depends on people people's sensitivity, which varies a lot person to person. Right, definitely does. Um, one thing I was just before going into that, she was talking about the gate thing. Uh, the, the there's rust on these gates and stuff like that. That they were seeing a gate that would last 15 years goes down to three to five. Well, the thing was, is like in 2018, if you had a gate that was right by the uh, one of those vents, it was like an inverted sandblaster. Instead of uh, taking off the rust, it applies rust really quickly. And I watched a galvanized steel gate go from very little rust to entirely rusted on the at least surface um, in probably a week of t uh, maybe less of time. Like it's it, it's nuclear options when it comes to rusting something. Yeah, yeah, uh, and you know, de depending whether that was from the the fissures themselves or like from the the lays where the lava goes into the ocean, the lava seawater interaction, which is a little different right. from the bog, but it's also like a, a, a similar kind of impact. Too. Yeah, I remember, remember back back in the day, you know, walking underneath the that uh, ocean entry cloud as as a USS volunteer, we're like with all gear on, gas masks and everything, helmets on. But like I was wearing a backpack that had little metal buckles, and the buckles after I walked through and back of there, like were all completely rusted too. Like it was just a matter of minutes, right close to the source. Right, my backpack wasn't as protected as I was. Turned out, right. so, you know, yeah. hard, hard way to learn. And it know. makes sense though. I mean, if anybody lives in by coastline, uh, they know about the rust and how how bad it can get. You throw in a little bit of sulfur in there too, or a lot of sulfur in there too, and a bunch of other uh, gnarly chemicals or gnarly elements. Yeah, it's gonna um, it's gonna apply that rust real quick. It might even be crazier than the uh, the vent exposure. Right. Hey. They were so, talking about the trees being resilient. That's always uh, you know we talk about that as well. It was interesting to me though about what was resilient. we you know like traditionally, I was told uh, like. The native plants grow up here. They're going to be more resilient to the SO2 because they've had time to evolve alongside the volcano. So, all right, yeah, that makes sense. And then the the acid test of 
the eruption uh, came through and things survived you might not expect and some things did worse than you might expect, at least in my mind, right? Um, seeing all these things just get thrown from green into, into uh, this acid bath and seeing what actually survives and what doesn't. I mean, it was, it, it immediately told you like, okay, well, um, you know, Myconia are really strong in the SO2. Even though, like, it was unexpected, but they're really good at it. Um, there was other ones that were just surprising. Yeah. So uh, I see we have a, a, a question come up here about which, which uh, heavy metals were detected. Um, and yeah, without going into a whole, oh, I was gonna, yeah, without without going into into a whole thing, I thought I'd just pu pull this image up on here that's just from uh, Ilyanskaya and all uh, twenty twenty one, right? Showing some of these elements. And I'll just put, flash them on the screen here, right? I mean, she was analyzing everything, um, all different elements here. So you're seeing selenium, uh, arsenic, lead, bismuth. I mean, always all kinds of stuff in there. Um, so, and obviously they're, they're seeing um, uptake in different um, proportions depending on the element, right? So that's kind of just a little summary there. But uh, um, yeah, for example, if you're looking at the highest concentrations, things like, uh, what is this, antimony right there? So in any case, we'll, we'll, we'll have to go into that a little bit more in detail. And, and there's a lot that, that's in there, but uh, in the future there. So that's a short answer to your question, Robert. And we'll continue. You ready, Dane? Um, now, uh, we're not the only ones that are dealing with VOG. So I wanted to show a couple examples of other places in the world that are also dealing with VOG. And one of those is Miyakajima Island. Uh, it's about 100 miles south of Tokyo. You can just barely see the gas and plume in this image. And uh, it's a very beloved island with a long social history and a lot of volcanic eruptions. And in 2000, there was a series of volcanic eruptions with very high amounts of uh, sulfur dioxide gas being released. So tens of thousands of tons per day. And um, <clears throat> eventually, in 2000, they did have to evacuate the whole island. And the people uh, came back permanently uh, in 2005. And this is a very tiny island. And, uh, this is the rough outline of the island. And the entire island would uh, fit in the summit area of Kilauea. And so here's Haleimau'umau'u, and here's Kilauea Iki. Uh, the golf course and Volcano Village. And um, with this translation to Kilauea, you can see just how close the people would be living to this very major degassing source. So now that the people are back on the island, there's a variety of strategies for living safely with the, with the log. Um, the residents all carry the gas masks. Uh, here's a picture of a worker, and they may not need to wear the gas mask, but they're all required to have a gas mask with them so that if there's a wind shift, they can protect themselves. Uh, they do have an SO2 advisory, um, slightly different than the one that we use here in Hawaii. And they have uh, raid sirens with these colored indicators so that when there's a dramatic increase in gas, they sound these raid sirens. Uh, they have a hazard map so that everyone's educated as to where the high concentration areas are. And they use engineering controls. So they have, this is desulfurization equipment uh, on a public building that also doubles as an evacuation shelter when the air quality gets very bad. And then uh, individuals are encouraged, and in some parts of the island required, to have their own individual uh, SO2 scrubbers in their homes. They can have safe indoor air quality. Um, they have taken advantage of their degassing volcano, and they're well known uh, for gas mask tourism. And um, before the eruption in 2000, there was a, um, uh, a sanctioned road bike stage race on the island, and it was part of the Tour of Japan. And of course, they had to cancel that uh, when the volcano erupted. But by 2007, the emission rates had come down, and so they started the race again. Uh, and these are some of the participants hamming it up for their souvenir photos. Um, and then also in 2007, uh, they began the We Ride Motorcycle Festival. And according to the, the tourism board, this was to enliven the island. And so tourism is alive and well on Miyakojima. Uh, if we travel to the southeast, um, to Vanuatu, uh, we can run into Ambrin Volcano. So it's uh, Vanuatu is between Australia and Fiji. And um, this is a NASA satellite image that shows the eruption plume from Ambrin uh, moving away from the island. And Ambrin, uh, oh, incidentally, this is the original title from the NASA page using this word bog, which was coined in Hawaii. Um, 
And amber emits uh, very large amounts of sulfur dioxide gas on the order uh, of the same amount as Kilauea, and sometimes much more. Uh, in contrast to Kilauea, however, it emits large amounts of fluoride, so in the form of hydrogen fluoride gas. And many of the people, so it's 30 to 50 times as much fluoride as emitted by Kilauea. And many of the people on the island, actually all the people on the island, uh, have used, traditionally used a rainwater catchment for the domestic water supply. And downwind of the volcano, about 99% of the cisterns were found to have fluoride levels in excess of the safe drinking water standard. And this is a, many of the kids on the island have this dental fluorosis, which is characterized by um, modeling, modeling of the teeth. And so the um, Australian Red Cross has actually been um, working to provide safe drinking water for residents of the island that are being impacted. Just want to mention that this is not a problem in Hawaii, um, where we have uh, low emissions of fluoride. Um, the studies that have come out for Ambrin, the question was, um, are they seeing any effects in skeletons? Um, and the studies that have come up, this is a fairly new finding, and um, so the studies that have come up have been mostly on the dental effects, and um, there haven't been any reports that I know of. Um, so I guess, you know, fluorine will, will um, attack the calcium from your teeth and from your bones. Um, so now... All right, I'll pause it there, Dane. And after those couple of examples from other places, Miyakajima and Ambram, of course, um, there's a lot there. What do you think? Yeah, the, the, the gas tourism thing was really interesting in Japan. I hadn't heard about that one. Um, uh, seems like it was training for COVID almost for the mask and the mask whole thing that was going on then. But yeah, then the ability to live with it is huge. Right. And, uh, you, you see people, uh, the people's ability to adapt to extreme or weird circumstances is quite impressive. And, you know, those, those are just examples. And we saw it in 2018, how, you know, people would adapt to it. Um, and crazy times, but people would go about it almost nonchalantly, kind of because you had to. What else are you going to do? Panic? So, yeah, it's um, really interesting to see how people, the different aspects of it, the fluoride, I'm kind of glad we don't have that issue. Because that, uh, yeah, that would have been. <laughs> <laughs> those cats would have all been uh, dealing that stuff out after 2018 if that was high in fluoride and that would have been big trips um when we went around and sampled many of the catchments a lot of them didn't even really need to be flushed out or anything like that they were they were okay um there was some issues with them but the ones directly in line with the downwind and stuff like that okay yeah yeah the, those things need to be cleaned out but i don't think i did mine 2018 like flush it all the way out, just flushed out the filters and stuff like that, ran some stuff through it and called it good. You know? Yeah. Um, Very interesting, though. Yeah, there was uh, some, some other interesting things there, right? Uh, sirens for Vogue? What do you think about that? I think that would not be a great idea, personally. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe... Uh, an application that automatically sent a notification to your phone or something like that uh, based upon your GPS and, you know, active monitors around you would be a better solution in, you know, 2022. But, you know, I could see in 2014 or 2008, 2010, why, you know, you'd be thinking, or even before that, because they probably built that in the 90s, let's be honest, um, or even those sirens. So, yeah, that's for then, definitely. I mean, what else are you going to do that back then? But yeah, nowadays, yeah. there's better, more elegant solutions. Well, you gotta, you gotta remember also the size of that island, right? It's like everything is really, really, really close. So, like you know, like you're talking about right, sirens right. that would be like just within a national park, just for gas in a national park kind of thing, right? Or right. just in Leilani for gas from you know that kind of thing. So maybe very, very, very localized. But in, yeah, interesting that they you know were able to you know in in the the desulfurization equipment, right? All that stuff. If you have to live close to it, which you know it's an island, you can't go. There's limited space, right? then here's, mm. here's how they've managed. And so interesting to note that, that they've been successful with that for the most part. Of course, 2018, as we say, would have been off the charts. Yeah, so. Yeah. At some yeah, point, you have to just run away. The island status. Come back later, yeah. you know. <laughs> it's, it's not worth. All right. So you ready for this last, last piece of this presentation? There's some yeah. Q&A if you want to get into right. it also, but um, let's play this here. Oh, hold on a second. Let's get this. 
Um, so now back in Hawaii, uh, there's a variety of, um, of strategies uh, for us to live comfortably with our volcano. And um, there's a number of web-based informational tools. Um, one of them is this SO2 and sulfate particle forecast model known as VMAP. And this shows one hour average concentrations during uh, trade wind conditions and it predicts the location of the plume. And these colors are tied to the State Department of Health SO2 advisory levels. Uh, State Department also of Health uh, offers 15 minute near real time SO2 concentrations for the stations that are around the island in their network. There's been some school-based monitoring. Um, the goal is to identify kids who have asthma or who are sensitive to the log and then move them into air-conditioned or dehumidified spaces. Um, there's some engineering controls that are being um, that are being sought after um, the new gymnasium in Pahala, as well as portions of the hospital there. Um, the, the plan is to provide air conditioning, so there's some uh, safe indoor space. Um, and then, um, anecdotally, people on the island have been using SO2 and particle scrubbers in their homes, um, reportedly to, to good effect. Um, there's also in Kau in particular, in this district, there's been smoking cessation and asthma management programs to try and help people with their health. Um, the National Park itself takes um, some actions during poor air quality. Um, as Jeff mentioned, the road downwind of this plume is closed. Um, the visitors and staff stay at least two kilometers away. And um, they also have um, an advisory that's online. It has nine stations for SO2 gas and two particle monitors. And um, during these various conditions, um, park managers do take actions, such as closing areas that are affected by fog. Um, on your way out, in case you haven't noticed this, the park also uses uh, engineering controls. So um, during high fog incidents, these doors are closed, and there's a strong blast of air that shoots downward from the blower to help keep the outside air from penetrating indoors. And then there's this industrial strength SO2 and particle filter that uh, purifies the indoor air. So uh, that's, that's the end of that main presentation. Um, anything you'd like to, to add about living with fog? Yeah, I mean, I I sometimes think just the, the, we, <laughs> the people in Kona just get it so much worse, even though, like, I'm one street away from Fisher 8. Um, unless you're directly downwind of it, and it's one of those days, and you're, it's really not that big of a deal. But I see those guys, I remember during the eruption in 2018, going over to Kona, even, you know, being in Pohoa the whole time, and then going to Kona and be like, oh my god, the fog is so bad. And that's coming from, you know, the site of the eruption going across the island back, wow, the fog's terrible here. Like, I can't even deal with it, um, type of thing. Which is, you know, weird. But the thing is, is when you're so close to the source, um, when it gets bad, you start feeling it more than smelling it. That's the best way to describe it. It starts mm -hmm. causing that pain in the back of your throat, type of thing, that frog in the back of your throat. And you start getting it a little bit more and more. Um, smelling it is when it's not bad, at least to me. Um, when you smell it, it's like, oh, okay, it's not that bad. When you feel it, it's like, okay, now, you know, that it's it's just thick. Uh, especially when you don't have the monitor. And even when during the eruption, a lot of the monitors, the guys, like with the National Guard, when I was cruising around with them, uh, they wouldn't exactly use their monitors. The guys were so used to it that they'd be like, oh, I, I can just feel it. You know, we're going to head this way. I don't want to wait for the monitor to confirm what I already know to be true. We're going to get out of here now, and the monitor, if we sat here for another minute, the monitor would confirm what I'm saying, type of thing. Um, but they wouldn't even use them, really. It's just, you know, right. getting used to it and that experience is better. So, yeah, obviously, you had to live with a lot higher concentrations in 2018, right? That's, that's kind of a whole, a whole different thing, but yeah, made it through. Um, you want to hear some other questions or anything else you want to add here? There's some audience questions. Uh, I think that's came with this video. Yeah, if we want to do a couple of those questions, the Q&A section. Elaborate on the effects on Hilo. Um, <clears throat> the question was, um, could we elaborate on the effects to Hilo? So before the 2008 eruption, no place on the island ever exceeded health standards except here in the National Park. No monitored place, let me rephrase that. No yeah. monitored place um, exceeded health standards except here in the National Park, very close to the, to the emission sources. Um, including Hilo, and then after 2008, um, that changed. And so now in Hilo, uh, there are occasional exceedances of health standards, and it's a mixture of gases and particles. Um, unlike Kona, which has very little gas, um, you get significant gas in Hilo. Does that answer your question? Oh, the magnitude. Uh, barely over the health standard. 
So um, the hourly, the health standard for an hourly average is 75 parts per billion. And uh, Hilo, uh, in 2008, there were some there were some higher uh, concentrations, uh, but currently um, it's you know it's above the health standard, but it's not very much above the health standard. And then that plot did show that it's not very frequently uh, since 2011. Um, it's it's less than one percent. So for instance, the way the EPA works this, they have this convoluted standard where they say, hmm, okay, so if, uh, if 99% of your hourly averages are above this level, uh, over averaged over a three-year period, uh, then you're within the standard. And if you exceed that, then you do not meet the standard. And um, A, you need to clean up your power plants if it's from an anthropogenic source, or you need to realize that there could be health impacts. You need to protect your health. Yes? Yeah, the, the question was, at what point do they evacuate the towns? And uh, early on in the eruption, uh, there were some evacuations. Uh, they evacuated the park, and they moved people down to Hilo. And by the time the people got down there, the wind had shifted and the plume blew to Hilo. Um, and so one of the lessons, I mean, early on, it, I mean, the response to the 2008 eruption was a big scramble, really. Uh, early on, uh, it seemed like a good idea to try and encourage people to leave. Uh, but what they found was that with the shifting winds, um, that the, the, the most practical official line was to shelter in place. So that is now the official policy, is um, the Department of Health, Civil Defense, it's shelter in place. <clears throat> that that overreaction though is kind of interesting, um, or the reaction, the initial reaction. The right. Question that, was because um, we saw that in 2018 as well, where yeah. the first few days were kind of the days where things could actually be done, and those were the days where authorities weren't allowing people in and then yeah. they're like okay well we can actually manage this let's send some people in and then it got heavy right, right. and then it, people were going in there and it's like wait 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 we thought everything was kind of killed it kind of chill this looks kind of crazy in here right now um you sure it's legit right now like it, you missed the time period you missed the slot and you know that that one of the things for next time is the the opening phase is really important to get correctly and if you botch that, you, you set yourself up on a on a bad uh, a bad road. It's going to get rougher and rougher. Yeah, interesting that it happened again. It keeps happening, right? And I don't think it's even unique to volcanoes, really. Um, I mean, it, you go throughout history, you'll find instances of people like in London during the uh, the 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 bombardment from the Germans. That people initially would start out like freaking out, and then after a few after a while the Seemed like they got used to it, you know. It's living with it. The, the ability to adjust is really impressive. Yeah, and then those hard times. Yeah. So we're we're running a little long. I'm not sure we're gonna get to our research stuff, but maybe we can just finish the questions on on the video here, and and we'll that call sounds it good. Yeah. All right. So we'll play some more questions here um, to discuss a little bit about SO2 in particulate, um, and how much SO2 is in the particulate, and what was the first part of your. The interaction. Okay, sorry. Um, so <clears throat> we used to have this fantastic demonstration back in the old days when there were overhead projectors. Because you can take a vial of invisible SO2 gas and you can oxidize it and it will, before your very eyes, turn to a solid particle. So the SO2 is actually chemically changing into the sulfate particle. And in some places, that conversion is complete as you get far away from the vent up the other islands to Kona. Uh, and so you don't have much SO2 at all. You have predominantly particles. Um, and then in other places, not all the SO2 has had the opportunity to convert. And so you have mixture. Um, what we read is that toxicologically, um, the mixture of the gas and particles is more irritating than either the gas alone or the particles alone. So the gas can absorb onto the particles and you can actually then uh, inhale it deep into your lung. SO2 is filtered out uh, in your upper respiratory. Like, that's why you taste it when you're in a lot of fog. You can taste the SO2 in the back of your throat. So um, it's dissolving, uh, which is a good thing because it's not making it into your lung. Uh, when you have the fine particles with the gas, 
Um, that's a pathway for it to be inhaled deeper into your lungs. Okay. Um, yeah. So you're saying not taking any SO2 and treating the H2SO4 within your respiratory system? Um, like I said, we're not health people. Um, what we do know is that a lot of it is filtered out in your upper respiratory, but probably not all of it. Not all of it gets filtered out. Um, so some of it, some of it is making it into your respiratory system. So you are getting that environment. So you may, uh, okay. yep. <laughs> One good thing about, uh, about SO2 is, because um, it does, because it's so highly water soluble, is that once it dissolves in those tissues, it kind of, it crosses the um, tissue blood barrier and your body figures out what to do with it. So basically, what the recommendations are is drink a lot of water <clears throat> and eventually it, eventually you pee it out. Is, yeah. is what, if it's if it's pretty dilute, then then that's that's likely true. But but still, you want to try and minimize your exposure. If you're downwind of that plume in the national park, if you were to go beyond the barrier and wind up in that plume, um, those concentrations are very very high, and those do burn your lungs when you when you breathe tens of ppm of SO2. I mean, you can you can feel it. Both both Tamar and I have been doing this for a number of years, and and we have compromised respiratory systems. Likely, <laughs> speaking personally, <laughs> how about you? I don't have asthma. <laughs> I don't have a respiratory crud right now. So there <laughs> uh, I think we are the poster children. <laughs> or something. Something, yeah. Yes. Uh, what what uh, contribution do the Hawaiian volcanoes have worldwide? Um, there's sig the oh, the question was, what's the worldwide contribution of Hawaiian volcanoes to the sulfur budget? And the answer is um, significant for volcanoes, insignificant compared to anthropogenic. Um, the question was if you can smell SO2, um, is that an indication that that long term standard uh, could be exceeded? And the answer to that um, is that your mileage may vary. So individuals have very different, this is one of the complicating factors, is that individuals have very different sensitivities to sulfur dioxide. Um, some people, uh, they, they don't detect it, they don't feel it, they don't respond to it. And other people are very, very sensitive. I mean, asthmatics, um, an asthmatic that's sensitive can start having lung function change at that 75 parts per billion, which is the, the EPA standard. One. So, um, yeah, Jeff was uh, noting that um, there was one death at Hale Mau Mau due to um, SO2 inhalation. And that was um, someone actually had an allergic reaction to, to, to SO2. Um, and by the time the medics got there, they, that, that was that. Yeah. Yeah, that's... The wording, the words that she used there, I haven't heard seen this one before, this especially the Q&A, but the wording she uses there to describe it, the, the almost allergic reaction, um, that was the same the way I, you know, experienced it in 2018 and what we saw. Many of the people that would uh, report stuff to us, just unlivable conditions, we would go there and have maybe varying experiences of ourselves and would just, through talking to so many different people, realize that there are people that are basically allergic to it at varying degrees and people that are resilient to it as well. People that seem like they can charge into it and all they get is a little bit of a throat ache type of thing. Um, it's unusual in that way. Yeah. But it was good to hear to actually explain it that way too. Like usually it's more hedging the bets that I hear. Um, that one is just straight up, you know, calling it, calling it. Right. And I, and I know that we, we say this stuff all the time, right? But, you know, um, we, it's because we've been listening to the USGS for years and years and years. And this is one example of kind of where, where we get our sources from, right? So just why I like to have, have other people actually say in the thing, too, besides me. Because, I mean, this is, these, these, these two people are the experts on gastrochemistry. Like, that's who we should listen to, right? That's who knows the most. So I think that might be one, one more or two more questions. Should we finish it off here? 
we can finish it off here. We think we do have a couple of our own questions to finish up with if we want to take those on, or at least one here. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Duchess asked um, about Pele's hair, um, the glass filament the volcano produces, and asking if uh, she's told to do not touch it because it was dangerous. So, do you want to take that one, or should I? Or maybe we just both talk about it. Yeah, you can go first. All right. So, yeah, it's definitely little glass fiberglass filaments, basically, that you're going to poke your hands and all kinds of stuff. The problem is, you know, getting poked is annoying. It's not all that bad in itself. The, the things where it gets bad is, one, it breaks off inside the wound. That sucks. Or, two, it gets into your eye or something like that. That really sucks. Um, I haven't had that one yet, and hopefully don't. But, the oh, the fiberglass in, or that uh Paley's hair in your fingers and all that oh yeah that was that was not uncommon after the eruption trying to clean up stuff you know go through the gutters and you, you just forget that you have to be wearing gl- gloves at all times type of thing and you just touch something it's like oh i got like two now in my hand um uh, great and then yeah. just these little tiny and in, in the beginning it was easier to identify them right but as the rain and everything breaks them down more they get smaller and smaller and then you just start getting you know pokes by things that you don't even see type of thing yeah they're no, not we're, deep or anything they yeah. kind of shock your system right Maybe like little scratches like little rashes whatever I mean, it's, it's not it's yeah. it's 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 it's, it's yeah it's like being says it's very sharp and a break off so like you know getting it in your eye is like pretty terrible right um if you were breathing breathing it if it was like pulverizing and breathing that would be like probably the worst right then that's like like actually yeah, breathing that, fiberglass like so you know you that's like really yeah. the, the worst of it you don't want to be like breaking it up and like sniffing kind of thing but people do touch it all the time right um we used to pick it up on pick it up on tours like very gently because it's glass and it'll it'll snap and break. Um, and so you pick it up and you can actually like look at it and hold it, but you know be very delicate with it. If you actually take your fingers and like slide it along it, you'll you'll slice yourself because it is sharpening and that it will cut you like that way as well. Right. Um, There's also varying degrees in the the thickness of them, right? So you'll have yeah. the thicker ones, and then you'll have some really thin ones that are like you know the thinnest little wire glass type of thing. Right. Um, so there's very they vary a little bit. Right. And and there you sometimes can't avoid them, right? Like you know, I, I you know, like working right. in a soil on my land, they're just in the soil even though there hasn't been pillies here here for a long time, you know? I mean, so yep. if, if you can just be gardening and get them in your hands. Um if you have pets that go outside, they can get them in their paws. There's all kinds of things like that that kind of complicate it, but um yeah, so that's that's why is because it's kind of, you know, uh, really, you know, it can be dangerous in a specific situations but most of all it's like uh, you know annoying and irritating yeah. and you there's know, like a, a hassle there's a mistake i made and many other people make only one time that's putting your leg down out on the fresh lava oh you yeah i think putting your backpack down and then you put it back on and you just yeah. slam your back with like hundreds yeah. of those things it's like oh, okay yeah never doing that again yeah they'll slide <laughs> through the like down. the hole in between your threads right <laughs> so like it kind of just gets right in there yeah, yeah exactly every time I remember like be- being at the hub, right, and just like you know, uh, leaning on my truck one time, and I realizing that, that there had been a, a deposit of Pele's hairs fall that day, and like leaning on my truck, and I sliced my arm, you know, or like kind of scratched it up, and I was all like you know itchy for a couple of days. Yeah. So uh, little stuff like that. So yeah, good question, Duch- yeah. Duchess Mahalo. Yep. All right. Well, I think that does it for us. We will be back next week, 5 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. That is our normal time slot. Unless anything changes, then we will go live with a special broadcast. We don't really expect anything. It doesn't look like anything's brewing on the volcanoes, but you never know. And if that happens, we will go live. Otherwise, uh, it looks like probably just me next week. So we'll do something um, for a volcano update. We'll go over a little bit of something and maybe uh, talk about um, one of the, another presentation. But yeah, um, anything you got want to finish with, Phil? Yeah, thanks, Dane. Yeah, so yeah, I'm going to be, be uh, uh, probably with not great internet next week, right? So we'll see if I can pre-record anything or if I can join your web. But, you know, Dane will probably be running a show. Um, we have plenty to talk about still. You know, um, we didn't really talk much about 2018 at all today. Uh, really, it's it's this this phase of the eruption kind of lasted a few weeks, so there's no need to kind of keep bringing it up constantly. But maybe next week might be something Dane chooses to dive into. And um there's all kinds of aspects of it, you know, as far as the timeline, as far as like the, the, what people did in response, there's a lot of that, that, you know, we were involved in that we haven't really spent a whole lot of time on yet. Um, we'll see what, uh, what you come up with there. 
And we will, uh, uh, since we didn't have time this week to do our little um, research roundup, we'll, we'll add to that um, for next week. You know, uh, Volcano Watch this week uh, is something we'll, we'll cover next week as well. You can probably see it posted on hawaiitracker.com. Nothing super urgent about our volcano, so it's, we'll, just, we'll just save it um, until then. So with all that being said, um, mahalo all you guys for joining. Uh, please like, share, subscribe. Um, yeah, um, see lots of action in the chat tonight. I'll have to go back and catch up on that. So I'm you guys for being involved there. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Um, we'll see if we can put out any other content. You know, if, if we do have to come back a little bit, we'll see what we can do. We're going to do a little extra for you guys at some point or another. So we'll see. It'll, it'll all work out, I am sure. So until next week, from whitetracker.com, he's Dane DuPont. I'm Philip Ong. Aloha.